going down, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Commander Ad Populum. Together we are Commander for the people, by the people, for the people. My name is Ryan. This is episode 40. We've made it all the way to episode 40. Today we are concluding our interview with Gavin Verhey, product architect for Wizards of the Coast. We get into a little bit more of his work-life balance, stuff like that how he deals with some of the pressures of of being the very visible face of Wizards of the Coast. So if you are into how to manage any of that in your own life, this is a great interview to listen to or share with significant other other people in your life that are interested in magic or just interested in learning about how to be a better young professional like Gavin is. Before we do though, big thank you to FusionGamingOnline.com. They are the official sponsors of Commander Ad Populum. They are there for all of your gaming needs. Appreciate working with them. I appreciate how quickly they ship to me. If you wanted to have them ship me something for any altered art cards that you'd like to add to your collection, of course, big thank you to all of the Patreon supporters at Patreon.com slash CadPopCast. You guys do make the show possible for me. And of course, don't forget to check out at CAD Popcast on Twitter, Commander Ad Populum on Facebook. Both of those platforms do have episode threads where you can comment or ask additional questions about the interviews that you're going to hear. So without further ado, let's get to it right now. Very excellent. So let's talk a little bit more about your actual work. You you had said that at t- 10 years ago, you used to play with your local friends. At some point, you got in the door at Wizards of the Coast and you became some form of game designer for them. And now you're one of their main guys. Give us give us a brief summary of that. Yeah, well, let me let's kick it back a little a little bit um, a long time ago. So f- for reference, I'm 29 right now, but I started playing magic 19 years ago when I was 10 years old. And I got the cards. I was in a Wizards of the Coast game store back when those existed. I got the cards. I brought them home. I learned how to play. I taught my brother. And we learned in January. And that was that was that became our, our thing, right? We started stopped playing as many video games. And we started just spending all the time, all of our time, playing Magic together, me and him. And it wasn't before long until I discovered the game stores, Friday Night Magic, and all this good stuff. And then... When I was 11, about after playing for about a year, playing constantly, I decided, well, this game is clearly the best. I love this game. I want to go make magic cards at Wizards. That's what I want to do with, with my life. And um, I didn't know exactly how I was going to do it, but I knew it's what I was wanted to do, and I, w- I felt ready. So fortunately, I lived in Seattle at the time, and one of the things about living in Seattle is Wizards is, is pretty close, and a lot of Wizards folks show up to Seattle events. And I was at a pre-release for Odyssey, and Randy Bueller was there. And Randy Bueller was the a VP of Magic R&D at the time. And I saw him and I knew who he was. And so I went up to him and I was 11 years old. And I said, hey, I'm ready to come work for you. Like, come hire me, you know, let, let's do this thing. And um, he looks at me really seriously. You know, he looks down at this 11-year-old kid. And he says, okay, kid, you're going to need two things. The first thing you're going to need is a college degree. And my heart just sinks, right? Because I'm... I'm 11 years old. It's going to take forever to get one of those. I'm ready to come work for you now. Uh. But the second thing he says is you should be a really good player because we like to hire people who know how to play magic well and can talk about magic well. And, of course, I thought, well, I don't know about this whole college degree thing, but a pro magic player, that's got to be easy, right? Anybody could do that. Oh, yeah, no problem. Yeah, no problem. Easy peasy. But so from that moment forward, I dedicated myself to becoming good at magic so I could be pro. And lo and behold, you know, I started college when I was 15 because, hey, I needed to graduate early. And when I was 16, I went pro in Magic. I qualified for my first pro tour. And I played pro throughout actually um, used professional Magic to pay for college. So playing in Magic and writing about Magic um, events helped me uh, pay for my college university education. And then I graduated college when I was 20. So I normally in the States, you graduate around you know, 21, 22. So I graduated a little bit early because I started early. And then within a year, I was hired by Wizards. And it worked out perfectly. I played professionally. I wrote Um, that got me noticed. I helped create modern in a way um, or popularize modern before modern was a thing, which caught Wizard's Eye. And I got brought in the fold and I've been here for over eight years now. And I love it. It's a great job. I'm surrounded by amazing people, truly some of the smartest people I've ever met. And I, I, I couldn't ask for much more. It's my dream job. 
So you literally used magic as a way to get you your dream job, which just happens to be magic. Now, I know that that's not everybody's dream job, but in what ways do you think that Magic the Gathering can help people achieve what you've achieved? There is there a certain amount of critical thinking that goes into it, uh, reading math or, or, or basic arithmetic at a very young age? Like you talked about being 10 years old. That's what is that, sixth grade? That's about when I started too. We're close to the same age. So your story is very relatable to mine being a, when I was a young professional. Now I'm a little bit older. What do you think, how do you think magic can, can influence or help people achieve what you've achieved? You know, a, a lot of people don't know this, but I was homeschooled growing up, uh, basically from kindergarten until I went to college. So I learned at home. My mom was taught me. Fortunately, she was a former teacher, so she had a great background in it. But magic was actually really integral to our education because it not only taught me quick arithmetic, but it taught me a lot of vocabulary words. The number of words I've learned through magic is staggering. And if you just think about the words you've probably learned through magic, I mean, it, it's an enormous amount. And I, the biggest thing is it taught me a lot of critical thinking skills, how to think for myself, how to, how to connect ideas, how to, um, how to be able to think about things like deck building and combat and thinking on your feet, all very important stuff. And then furthermore, as I got deeper and deeper into it, things like learning how to run a team, work with other people, Good sportsmanship. Like all these things are things that I learned through magic. And magic was so integral for me to learn all of this. So those are those are just a few things. But I think in in life, there's a lot of skills that magic will teach you that will really, really, really be useful. And the biggest one to me is just the ability to adapt, take feedback, provide feedback, and think on your on your feet. A lot of magic is just feedback cycles. You know, you'll go and play your deck, you'll see how it does, you'll go back and tweak your deck, you'll go out and see how it does, you'll iterate. Or you ask someone for their opinion. They'll tell you what, what they think. You'll ask for someone else's uh, a, a opinion and, you know, they'll, they'll tell you information or, you know, vice versa, whatever. All the research that goes into deck building and construction, there's so many good work ethic tools that magic teaches you. And there are so many things that you can learn from this game that you can apply to your life. It's astounding to me. Like the, I remember when I was in college, everyone else was flipping out about these really, really hard tests with all this pressure. And I was like... Last weekend, I played under a feature match for thousands of dollars. None of this bothers me anymore. Like I don't get, I don't get pressure from a lot of events in my life, and I can be very calm. So, I can't even describe the number of ways that magic has impacted my life. You know, I think for a lot of things, I can look back and think about what my life would be like if I didn't do this thing. With magic, I literally cannot imagine my life without having started to play magic. I mean, it is unbelievable. And uh, I'm, I'm so happy that I could be part of this amazing community full of friends, full of this game that I love. And I picked up so many skills along the way. I recommend it to everybody. And if you're listening to this and you don't play Magic, first of all, I, I'm surprised you got this far. But second of all, I highly, highly recommend it. And I recommend it to kids. I recommend it to parents. I recommend it to anyone out there. It is truly, truly amazing. Yeah. A couple things. First thing. Gavin Verhe, hardened by the forge of magic before the age of 20. That was the first, that's like the the the, the clickbait title right there, right? Yeah, the tell BuzzFeed. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Second thing is everybody who's listening out there who works with kids, because I know that there's a lot of you, have them listen to that. Have their parents listen to that. Anybody out there who is who can relate to what Gavin was saying about not being able to imagine your life without magic. I know I've said on Commander Ed Populum or Commander Cookout somewhere that I honestly believe that magic saved my life. And it sounds, it sounds like you are in a similar boat, which I think is absolutely incredible. Oh, you know, I get emails and messages all the time being in my position from people who completely had their life turned around from magic, not just in teaching them things. I mean, that, that's certainly one avenue to go down in a big part of the game. But also just like a lot of people who have been in very dark places. You know, I get messages from people who were on the brink of suicide or got out of a really bad relationship or had to move away from home um, or you know, because their parents weren't getting along with them or whatever. And they're like, magic is the thing that got me through it. The magic in the magic community is what got me through it. And I hear this story all the time. I get emails about this constantly. 
And it's not just an isolated experience. And if you're feeling depressed or anything and you think magic is carrying you through it, you're not alone in that. There's a lot of people out there like that. Now, none of this, of course, is magic is not a substitute for actually going to a professional and getting their opinion. And I highly recommend if you're feeling depressed, talking to a therapist about it and seeing what, what might be right for you. But magic is certainly a great outlet for, for a, lot of, um, a lot of people. And it's really made a huge, truly a tremendous impact in my life. And my mom will go, will talk up and down about how great magic was for me and but my brother both. Um, so if you need some, if you parents need someone to talk to, I can direct you to her. Um, there's this place in New York called Games Lab. Uh, they've got a spot in Brooklyn, I think a couple in Manhattan as well. And it is so cool. And what it is, is it's this area set up, kind of like an after school place for kids to play and learn about board games and game design. And um, middle school, some high schoolers will come on in and they'll play new board games and talk about them. They'll learn the rules. They'll also just adjust their own tweaks. In fact, one of the boards on the wall is all just full of note cards of suggestions kids have made to change and modify games. So starting the game design career early. It's actually there's a whole system where you can level up and get experience points and eventually join a guild. And there are these cool guilds that they made up. But one of the cool things to me is um, – they have a big magic night. A lot of the kids there play magic. And um, after school, their parents take them there, and they will. They are magic decks there on borrow. They can just borrow modern decks, for example, and sit down and play games. And it is the coolest, coolest thing to me to see this whole generation of kids learning magic and playing with each other and their parents being like, I want my kid to go and play this. It's a great environment. They're making friends. They're building skills. So first of all, if you're in New York, go and check it out. But second of all, let that just be a testament to how amazing this game is that it's building these communities and really these positive environments that the parents see and they're like, wow, I'm so glad my, my kids have something like this. And I'll admit, you know, when I was 10 and 11 and 12 years old, and my parents were dropping me off at game stores full of 20 and 30 year olds for Friday Night, Night Magic. That was a little daunting experience, right? They had to, they were like, is this really the best thing for my kid? And admittedly, you know, I'm sure there were moments there where it may have not have been in some cases. But oh, on the whole, it definitely was. And especially if you can find a place, and there's a number here in Seattle where our, um, we're very kid friendly, I, I think it's absolutely worth checking out. Yeah, you know what? It's it's funny is their a game lab is making it fun for kids to learn, and that's actually the best scenario to learn in when you're having fun, because then it doesn't feel like learning, doesn't feel like school. Lots of kids don't like school, right? Right, right. You know, I think there's a lot of research on gamification and how making things feel like games can go a long way. And there's one article I read um, about the school I think out in Pennsylvania. They gamified their classroom. And they did nothing. They changed the material zero. They didn't change any of the material they were learning. This changed how it was presented. So by doing tests and homework, you would gain experience points. Um, <clears throat> there was a leaderboard for experience points. The, f the final exams at the end of the year were framed as boss fights. They, they just did very, very, very tiny minor things with nomenclature. And the attendance and the success of these kids went through the roof. And all they had to do was reframe it to make it sound more fun. And I think I have a, lot, have a lot of opinions about education. We'll not get into them today. But I think education has been done the same way for a very long time. And there's, in today's world, what worked for kids 50 years ago or more is not what's going to work for them today or, or work for even me today. And thinking about new ways to evolve the classroom and evolve learning is really relevant. And as someone who is homeschooled, I feel so fortunate that I got my learning and what was good to be catered to what was good for me and my brother. And that did some amazing things for us. And literally, there were times where we would play magic as part of our homework or do research on magic as part of our, our homework because there were elements of it that were going to be useful to our education. Um, so I, I, once again, I just cannot tout that highly enough. That's unreal. I'm, I, I didn't know that about the school you were talking about in Pennsylvania. If anybody knows what school that is, of course, get at me at CAD Popcast or get at Gavin and let us know. Let's let's look into that a little bit more if that interests us. Any of the listeners out there that have kids like I do or like a lot of our listeners do. Last thing, because I know that you're going to be a little bit crunched for time and this is going to be another sort of big topic. You're a young professional, 29 years old, you say. You're working in what I would call a high pressure or a high profile or a very visible position. How do you manage it? What are some of the things that you do or what are some of the challenges you've overcome and how did you overcome them? Yeah. 
Um, you're absolutely right. That is a high pressure position. You know, I'm one of the people at the top of this company that is huge. Um, I mean, yeah, at the top is a strong word. I'm not a director or anything like that, but I'm, I'm a very well-known person and I make a lot of big decisions that impact this game at the top of a company, um, of a large company that makes a lot of money, has a lot at stake, has a lot of employees. It has, you know, millions upon millions upon millions of players around the world that it's trying to make happy and they all have opinions. And there is a lot of pressure on me and I do a lot of work. I mean, I've been up till 2 a.m. multiple times this week just trying to get stuff done. And right now we're making more than ever. We are doing so much around the clock and trying to manage a personal and professional life at the same time, right? Trying to make sure that I can still see my friends and have regular social outings and I can do all the travel I want. And all of these things is a really, is a lot. It's a big challenge, something I've had to learn to do. I've had to do a lot of finding time in places where time doesn't normally exist. You know, I do a lot of thinking in the shower um, because it's a great time to be thinking about things. I do a lot of checking social media when I'm walking between meetings. Like, okay, I'll leave one meeting, go to another. I've got two minutes. Let's check Twitter and reply to a few people when I can. Um, But a really important thing to me, by the way, is to be present. So when I'm in a meeting or I'm talking with someone, I'm not on my phone because I really want to focus on the conversation there. But I think the biggest thing about the pressure is Magic's in a very unique position where, it, and I'm in a very unique position within Magic. I'm one of the very few people that is very public facing. So I get messaged by people all the time, constantly. A lot of people know who I am. And while that sounds great and easy and wonderful, like, oh my gosh, it's probably great being this Magic celebrity to the point where you get recognized when you go to little islands in Portugal. Certainly that is cool and I, and I love that part of it. It also has the flip side of it, which is you're the person that people are going to complain to or uh, blame when things don't go right or people want to talk to you about certain things when when they're not going well. And I fortunately have a very thick skin, you know, as someone who kind of grew up on the internet. When I was 13 years old, I was running the biggest magic forum in the world. Um, And I've had to deal with all kinds of people yelling at me about things for a very long time. So I'm okay with it. And um, a way that I've kind of learned to deal with it or to internalize it is whenever someone's complaining about something to you, Almost always, it's because there's a legitimate reason behind their complaint. And even if they're using mean ways to say it or what they're really saying is, I love this game. I want this game to be better. Please make it better for me. And that shows that people care and that there's a meaning behind what they say. I mean, if they just say, yeah, Gavin, go jump off a bridge. Okay, well, that's not really very useful feedback. But in general, any kind of feedback we get, even incredibly incendiary stuff, is usually useful in some fashion because it says, hey, this player really cares about this kind of thing. So I look for that. Um, and I have to be really careful to not let it seep into my, um, into my pers- personal life. And I've gotten pretty good about that. But, you know, I'll give you an example. Last year, no, I guess it's tw- the year 2020 now. Two years ago, um, my friend had his bachelor party. Okay. It was a really good friend of mine. He was getting married. Um, and we were out uh, for a night. We had like a really, really long night out. Of course, you can imagine the kind of things that might happen at a bachelor party. Although we're all a bunch of nerds, so I guess maybe imagine a lot more games than what you were. We played D&D. It was a whole thing. Anyway, but there was you know plenty of alcohol involved and, and other things. And um, when we – the next morning, I woke up and I check, checked Twitter and I checked the internet because that's what I do in the mornings when I wake up. And th- th- um, Commander 2018 previews had finished and the internet was – Super abuzz at me. They were not happy with the way the reprints in the project had gone down. There were threads on Reddit asking for me to be fired, all this stuff. And in the meantime, it's Saturday's Saturday. It's my the rest of my friend's bachelor party, and I have to be present there with him doing stuff there. Well, in the meantime, the internet is blowing up about me, and I know that if I, if I don't take the time to like do something about it, it's just going to spiral out of control. And that's the kind of position I get put in. That's one example, but that's the position that I get put in all the time of your wedge between your personal life and social media. Because for a lot of people out there, a lot of people listening, work ends when you come home or work ends on the weekends when you're not working. You know, maybe you think about it a little bit or think about a situation, but you kind of leave it at home a little bit. And for me, that's never true. I'm kind of working all the time, right, 24-7 because I always have my phone in my pocket. I always have social media available to me. There's always a magic thing that could happen. I'm always thinking about about new things we could do with with the game. And so constantly being connected to the game in that way is wonderful but also has its its downsides too. And um, I've had to get really good. And in this particular case, I, you know, responded to a few tweets, 
said a few things that would kind of set things on course, and then thought, you know, look, I really have to focus on my friend right now because that's important. I can come back to, to this later. But it's this constant Spider-Man situation of do you save the one person who's, um, you know, who, who you really care about, who's your friend, right? Or do you address the thousands of people on this bus over here um, who are all part of this magic world and community? And they're both very important to me. And knowing how to tackle them both um, – and do it with grace is something that I've had to learn. And I don't think I'm perfect at it. I don't think anyone is perfect at it. But I try and do the best job I can. And ultimately, I mean, the fans in Magic are some of the most important people in my life to me. I love talking with them. I love that we have fans for our game. And I try and do everything that I can for them while not allowing my uh, personal life to suffer as well. And one thing I ask of everyone out there, too, is, you know, uh, I think Mark Rosewater had a great Tumblr post a couple years back where he talked about how he was writing his post while flipping burgers um, for his family. And... Um, you know, be aware that we all have lives we're trying to go through just the same that you do too. And there's a lot of things we're trying to manage and we're trying to do the best job we can and reply to you as quickly as we can. But it does come down to, like I said earlier, some of that economy of time stuff I was, was talking about where we only have so much time and we're trying to do everything we can, but sometimes there's only so many seconds in a day. And if we don't get back to you right away or you don't see a response from us right away, it's not that we're ignoring it. Almost certainly we've seen it and are thinking about it in our heads, but it might just take more time than um, you would ideally want. Yeah, you know what? I think that the take-home message from some of what you're saying there for other young professionals out there that are listening is that being present is one of the most important things that you can do while you're at work and when you're at home. And it is important to be connected to your work, but it's also important to find time for that separation. It's important to have a plan and it's important to be able to unwind or unpack some of that pressure and we've done episodes on commander ad populum for any new listeners out there on all of those topics so when we're done here with gavin uh, at the end of the show i'm going to insert a few of the episodes just links to the episodes so people can kind of hear what other guests have to say about that kind of stuff dealing with issues making plans depression and anxiety we've talked about all those things so stay tuned after the interview with gavin to to hear my final thoughts on some of that stuff. I think though, Gavin, great answers on all parts. I know that you're a little bit going to be crunched for time. So I wanted to get back to a couple of the CAD pop quick hits to round out our conversation. Fantastic. Let's do it. Okay. You talk about game design. You talk about entering into Wizards of the Coast. You weren't always doing what you're doing now. You used to just work on sets, right? Yeah. You know, I think Everyone kind of has their own path in New Wizards. When I came in, I was actually a development intern. Development um, would nowadays be called play design, so play testing and tweaking and things like that. And then I had a very long route all around the company. I've done all kinds of different things at different points in time. I've you know, been lead designer of a number of sets and still am. For example, I just um, did a bunch of lead design work on the Mystery Booster play test cards and I try and do some design work as well. I was on the design team for the upcoming Aquaria set. Um, but architecture is the thing that takes up the most of my time right now. Um, and my position is really unique in that I wear a lot of hats at once. You know, I'm trying to do social media presence. I'm trying to plan events and work on Command Fest and Magic Fest. So I'm trying to fly around and have and um, be a public speaker at places um, while I'm also trying to design sets and do stuff back here. So um, I, I touch a lot of different things at a lot of different points, and my route here has been all over the place. And I've done so many things at Wizards, you know, say from like the finance department or whatever. I've touched a lot of things in a lot of places. I've even done some work, a little bit of work on D&D. So um, I, I know the company really well, and I am so happy that I've got to touch so many parts of our games in so many ways. So here's the quick hit then. If you had one opportunity to change one game mechanic in Commander, or Magic the Gathering in, in general, what would it be? Well, wow. There are so many options. I'm going to go Just one. with the lowest hanging fruit, which is I would personally, because this is a Commander podcast and I feel like talking about Commander is reasonable, I personally, and I know Sheldon will glare at me from somewhere right now, I personally would change the how the hybrid rules work in Commander. So you can play, for example, Kitchen Finks in your mono white deck. That rule always bugs me when building decks. It's like, I can normally play this in a mono white deck. Why can't I put this in my commander deck? And from a design perspective, it actually really limits us because there's a lot of things we could be doing with hybrid legends that are very interesting and allowing you to put them in, in uh, certain kinds of decks. 
And uh, I, I feel like we're limited in that space. I respect it's not going to change, and the Rules Committee has a different opinion on it. And frankly, a lot of people in this office have different opinions on it. Like me and Rosewater, for example, are aligned in wishing the hybrid rule worked a different way. But Aaron Forsyth and Mark Gottlieb both are very happy with the way it currently works. So it's not something that I would expect it to change, but it's something that I personally would, would modify off the top of my head. Sacrilege. Blasphemy. Yeah. I, Blasphemy. I also, I am also, by the way, not a huge fan of the commander damage rule, but I, I respect why it's there. And uh, once again, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. And I know somewhere the rules committee is probably glaring at me, but I want to be very clear. These are my own personal opinions of what I, Gavin, the player who plays the game and thinks about game design likes, not what's necessarily best for the format or what the rules committee is going to do. I just, I wish it would be these ways. I'd be curious to know what the audience out there thinks about those two things, though. Please chime in, um, send me tweets about what you think about both commander damage and um, the, the hybrid mana. The thing about commander damage to me is it. It's a thing that you have to track all the time every game that almost never matters. If you build a deck around it, great. Some people will build decks around it. It does help curb life gain, but I hate all the tracking. From a game design perspective, it's just really, really messy. I wish there was a better solution for it, personally. Um, it's like you've got to be an accountant to be able to know if you're going to die to somebody's commander damage. Well, and the thing that ends up happening, too, is in practice, most people don't track commander damage. I mean, when I'm playing at Command Fest, normally people people don't track it unless they think it's going to be an issue. And then, of course, that leads into some games where you're like three quarters of the way through and you're like, um, okay, did this hit you two times or three times? And no one can remember. <laughs> yeah, that's real so. life. Yeah, that's real life. Do you think that it would be better if it was 21 points of commander damage from any any commander, like a, a, a summation of commander damage or a summation of damage dealt by cards that have the same name as a commander? There's a lot of ways to go down it. And, but in general, I just favor things that require less tracking. And I think any way you go about this, you're still going to have that extra tracking of that thing you don't want to keep track of. Because life is kind of the thing you want to keep track of. Keeping track of secondary life is always a bit of a hassle, especially with you know apps and dice and everything. It's something that is tricky because suddenly you have like five dice in front of you and someone looks over to see what your life total is and no one knows what the actual answer is. Um, so that's my, my one personal thing. But once again, I would not expect that to actually change anytime soon. And one of the things that I appreciate about having the Commander Rules Committee is they keep us honest with the spirit of the format and the, make sure that the community, it's a community format for the community, and it's not just us thinking about it. Because ultimately, Commander, out of all the casual formats, Commander is the one that caught fire and did well. Clearly, the Rules Committee knows what they're doing to some degree um, because it, it did, did pretty well there. So I'm willing to trust them on a lot of this stuff. That's right. They came up with, and we've talked about it lots on Commander Ad Populum, we've talked about Rule Zero, which is the, the second to last quick hit. Tips for playing outside of your local meta or your local group of friends if there are difficult players or players who don't necessarily fit into your idea of what is fun. Is it just conversation? Is it communication? What's the best way to approach this? Like any interpersonal topic, it can be really, really hard. Right. It's like you in some cases you have to just you're going to need to tell someone, look, you have to stop playing that deck. We're not having fun. And we see this all the time. Right. People at Command Fest even where you'll see three players will sit down trying to play a pretty, you know, low key, low powered game of commander. And someone will sit down with a really competitive deck and quickly stop everyone else. I have found that in general, the commander community is getting better about talking to each other about deck power levels, but I'm sure there's still a lot of people out there who um, you know, are having, having challenges with it. And I think like any hard conversation, it's really important to just tell that person and be honest with them. But don't, this is just a tip for all interpersonal communications, don't attack the person, talk about what they're doing and why it's a problem. Um, so if they're, if they're someone who's playing their mass LD Armageddon deck all of the time, one way you could combat that is by everyone puts sacred ground to, the, to their deck or whatever, but that's that's not that fun, right? Um, I would just talk to that person and say, hey, look, we're really not enjoying all these mass land destruction spells. Your decks are making the games be less fun because of it. Are there ways that you could take them out or potentially look at different options? And some people are going to be really obstinate about it, and in those cases... You may need to, um, you know, you may need to consider other options, or you know, potentially saying, "Hey, look, if you're going to play this way, we're not going to have fun playing with you." Um, but I would hope that most people would be receptive to feedback like that and and change their decks up. Very excellent. Okay, final quick hit, and this one is a little bit off topic, but I really like this question. Is it a possibility to ever see a more 
adult focused magic product similar to Game of Thrones or The Witcher, something on that kind of level for adult players? You know, I think that's an interesting question because I already think magic is pretty adult. And, you know, you think at what makes The Witcher or Game of Thrones so adult in quotation marks. And I think about things like the, the blood and the violence, the sex, the, um, you know, the cursing, whatever. But when I think about what the stories that are being told here, a lot of, you strip away, I mean, the, those things, the blood, the violence, the sex, the cursing, those are just trappings. Those are things that are stylistic choice made to um, create a sense of maybe grittiness or um, uh, quote unquote adultness. But if you just look at the content of the stories themselves, at the at what's happening in them, at the scale, at the at the themes, I would say that magic is comparable to a lot of a lot of these other things. Like we have story arcs that span across um, all kinds of emotional arcs, from romance to to death to worlds take, being taken over and conquered to villains and heroes. A lot of what you see present in these stories is also present in magic. And while it's true that it might not be as narratively deep as, say, a Game of Thrones, ultimately that's just the restriction of the medium. You know, Game of Thrones has lofty, long books and many, many arcs that it gets to tell. Well, we get to kind of tell things through cards. And our general rule is about any given set can tell one sentence of story effectively that most players will, will end up learning about. With that said, with the upcoming Netflix series, we're going to finally have the opportunity to tell things in a longer medium, and you might see some of what you're looking for in there. So personally, I think magic is pretty pretty adult already, um, and there is a lot of, of those thematically adult themes running through it. Yeah, you know what? I I think that you're right, and I like the the comparison or or the use of magic as a medium. It's like enjoying art through oil painting versus enjoying art through music on on a CD or an MP3 download, right? It's it's both of them are forms of art, but the way that we enjoy them is completely different. And there are a lot of plenty of gruesome cards out there, you know. Don't, don't <laughs> yeah, don't most certainly. <laughs> there are some cards I still have trouble looking at the art for. So, don't even get me started on mutilate the original mutilate. Ugh, sh- shivers every time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That that was an Odyssey card, right? From your heyday. Yeah. For Odyssey Black. I think it was in Torment, but yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. You're right. That was the Black set. Yeah. Yeah. Good times. Yeah. That's right. Well, you know what? That is probably going to be all that we have time for because you have a meeting coming up very shortly. I want to say one more big thank you to you for taking time out of your busy, busy schedule, as you've told us. Can you give the listeners one more run through of where they can find you as if they already don't know? Well, yeah, first of all, thanks for having me on. And while I do have a busy schedule, and as I've said, I have a lot of stuff going on, I always try and make time for fans and podcasts because this is so important to me. Like I started doing podcasts many years ago. I know how wonderful this is. I know many people listen and I, I love talking with the community. So to me, this is a great way to you know, spend a little bit of my time to make sure I can talk with all of you. Um, if you're looking for me and you want to talk to me or have other topics, please hit me up. I'm at Gavin Verhe. You can find me on Twitter, on Instagram. Those are maybe the two best places to reach me. But in a pinch, you can always message me on Facebook or Tumblr as well or anywhere else that, that you find me. And I'll hopefully see you all at some magic events this year. Okay, and that is it. One big last thank you to Gavin for taking time out of his busy schedule. He he actually told me before we started that he's got a hard go right at 11 because he has a meeting and we got him out with about nine minutes to spare. So I'm sure he was going to go have a quick bite to eat and then get into his meeting. A few minutes from the end of our conversation, I did mention that we've had other guests on the show to talk about things like depression, anxiety, dealing with addictions and recovery. So if you're into any of that and you are a new listener and you haven't quite heard any of those yet, they are episodes 14 and 15 where we talk about depression and anxiety. They are episodes 22 and 23 where we talk about how magic has helped us with addictions in the past. And then of course I've got various other episodes that just talk about kind of having a game plan and how magic can help us understand how to plan and think on our feet and all the stuff that Gavin very articulately said that I'm kind of just fumbling through as I'm remembering what we talked about. Of course, links to those are available on the 
Patreon feed for Commander Ad Populum. Everything is there at no charge. You don't have to be a patron to listen to the podcast. Of course, you can scroll through your feed on Apple Podcasts or Google Play or wherever you get it. And of course, the threads to those are available on the Commander Ad Populum Facebook group and in the backlogs of all my previous tweets throughout time. So you can go find those and join in the conversation. Or, of course, let me know how you like the interview with Gavin on the Commander Ad Populum Discord channel. That's one of the Patreon benefits. Huge thank you to official sponsors, FusionGamingOnline.com, for all of your, let's say, torment needs. Because we were talking about Mutilate from Torment. You can pick that card up there. It's actually a good card in Commander. It's a five mana, probably kill everything sweeper type spell and that's it everybody i'll be back next wednesday for another episode of commander ad populum i've got a few topics and a few more guests lined up for the i'm gonna call it distant future some of my own personal friends that i've asked to come on the show and just talk about kind of what they do and how how they do magic from where they're from being in different parts of the world than i am so that should be a ton of fun both for me for them for you for everybody until then everybody i will see you next wednesday